at Star East 2025 in Orlando. I'm Scott Moore, and I am with the immutable Jonathan Wright. Great to see you again, Scott. I think, where was it, Detroit last time we were? That's right, at Cube, CubeCon. Cube. I think that was 2022 or 2023. I can't remember too many brain cells ago. What's your impression of this conference? It's interesting. You know, I, I must admit I'm a bit surprised, you know. Because In what way? I, I think we're all feeling the fatigue of AI, right? It's led a lot of the submissions. We're starting, it's starting to get, it's maybe the second or third year where we're just doing it to death in a way. We're retro-engineering AI into places just for the AI-powered tag. AI's been around for a long time, right? You know this. Sure, you know. sure. It's not something brand new. It is brand new to a lot of people. Yeah. And I think it's because it's been Hollywood eyes. Sure. Right? My two big things were, first, it's actually not closing the gap. It's expanding the gap between juniors and professionals. The average tester, and this is a test automation engineer, has less than two years experience. That's the average, right? And out of that, they've had two weeks of formalized training on True. average. True. And then within the tool landscape, because, you know, if you're using a tool, you need to have some kind of formalized capability, is less than one week, right? So it feels like they're the perfect candidates to give this augmentation to to give them better capabilities but you said you feel like there's going to be a widening of the gap between yep. a junior and a senior why right. and you i think that. and it's the same thing we got just then it's prompting right it's like we all sold the dream two years ago we were at every conference saying do prompt engineering and then reasoning came along probably 18 months ago and started simulating for a second thinking but what's happened is the responses are getting so good that a junior will just take it and pass it out and i it's like when i read submissions when i read reports i just can smell the the chat gpt so i can see the gaps where you've we've had support you know you've you started in the 90s you have uh you have you know that the weak spot is analysis right mm -hmm. i Do, know when it's hallucinating basically yeah, you know all this stuff right and suddenly these tools are incredibly powerful for you right but the juniors that are coming in and just going oh well yeah write me a j meter uh, script you think to yourself why why even bother right you may as well just and this is what i think the the, the thing is it's lazy and it's not as productive and it's not as powerful as you think it is. Now, there is the other side, right? The other side is we've had a lot of bad press, right? We've had a lot of bad press with this idea that, yes, it doesn't contextually know things. And therefore, they've started releasing things like MCP, right? Model Context Protocol. Mm -hmm. If you look at Model uh, Context Protocol, it's just a hat stack of case switches, right? Mm -hmm. MCP is just exposing a whole stack of Selenium capabilities, right? Right, right? Which are, in essence, frameworks that people have written over and over with a lot of case switches. I think now we've got to think about not just, okay, we can automate something. You know, I think that silver bullet's gone, right? How do we educate people to think about engineering in quality, thinking of non-functional performance engineering disciplines? We've oversimplified testing and we've sold a dream that tools will help you do the job. We've been talking about prompt engineering with Gen AI for the last year and a half, two years, or th almost three. But you said you don't do prompt engineering, you do chain of thought. Explain to people what that means. Yeah, so I, I think this is really important. A lot of people think of Copilot as open AI, right? As, you know, you're going to prompt, you're going to ask it a question. That's not what Copilot is, right? Copilot is a bit like an RPA tool. You know, it's actually process mining. It's looking at what you do. And then there's something called Copilot Studio, which is looking at those, let's call them flow, process flows for a second, or workflows, whatever you want to call them. And then saying, well, actually, you know, I see you doing something like a Salesforce report, where you pull all the information into Power Pivot, you generate this report, and you pass, you email it to your boss, right? That is a number of different steps, right? And you could say, well, I'm going to write a prompt for this, a prompt for that, a prompt for I this. I see, I see. So what Chain of Thought is doing is that actually it's optimizing each one of those steps. Right? As it goes. As it goes. So where you go, what we used to call prompt chaining is you would chain them together and it would be dependent on the, what happened on the previous one. The sales figures are down. Okay, well, why is that, right? 
oh, wait a second, we're looking, and actually the pipeline's dropping out, and it's less than 2%, and last year it was 5% full so at this at this funnel. So it's starting to overlay business rules and understandings of how your company works, right? right? right. I think you can't expose to, let's say, OpenAI for a second. You can't say to it, tell me how my CRM system works. Because it has no idea, right? It doesn't right. know how you've configured it. It doesn't know how your, your special source is put together. So it can't help you, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas what smartly Microsoft have been doing in the background is going, well, actually, if we create Microsoft Graph, which if you turn on your Fiddler or your you know, Wireshark, you'll see it's sending GraphQL messages of everything you're doing. You do a trans transcript on a meeting, sending it to Microsoft Graph, and it's going, Jonathan team is this you know his team are working on these active acti activities here are the confluence pages that they're generating starts building in that knowledge and so chain of thought is superseded by chain of graph which is contextual information that's been pulled in from lots of sources of truth so you've got a, a document you've wrote, you've got some code you've written, right? Your code is then translated into documentation. It's then fed into the system as a reference. And it can then go, well, wait a second, you wrote this ticket here. You had this conversation here with the product guy. And you also, you know, have, have, have put some, you know, code in here and your tests are here. Do they all align? Now, we know just by me, me saying that, that's incredibly complex, mm -hmm. right? And how can they possibly do it? Two years' experience as a, as a tester. And, yeah, going back to your example, yeah. And and they come here, and we're just telling them, it's AI, right? Yeah. It's prompting. You know, do write a prompt, kick out some scripts, yeah, right? right? That's not not the real, okay. real world, right? So let's just go a little bit sideways here, because we've talked about generative AI in these circles for so long, but now we're hearing about agentic AI, yeah. causal AI, there's other pieces of this, where do they play? Yeah, so, you know, originally, I kind of was excited, like I said, agentic AI felt like it had grown up, right? That generative, which was really narrow, like super narrow, right? And I, I, in a way, I was just, for the last three years, I've just been massively disappointed. This subset has come through, which is natural language understanding, natural language generation. And the generation part of it is now to the point where it's able to generate content that, let's call it fools you enough, right? To believe that it's magic, right? right. You ask it what the state of something is or a question, it's going to come back with an answer. Nothing different to what we saw with Siri or whatever 10 years ago. Right? Sure. There's not, the difference is now it's more accessible. And everyone's using it and everyone's talking about it. Like you get in an Uber, you go and speak to your, you know, a friend, they all talk about it. I hear literally, even while I've been here, they're literally like, oh yeah, had this conversation, talks about some political thing. And she said this, you know, people have even got this kind of characteristic of that, that this person's helping them. Now, Agentic was born out of large Agentic models, which very quickly became large action models. Now, this is when suddenly people like Sam were just hiring anyone with automation experience and hoovering them up because they realized that actually some text to text conversion, that's not very powerful, right? But if you have text to action, that could be incredibly powerful. The Microsoft estate, surprise, surprise, which is why they got the co-pilot button there. They've also got an MPU, a neural processing unit, which is a dedicated processing capability just for native AI mm -hmm. applications. You know, it suddenly will launch an application. And we're like, wow, this is just what we've seen 100 times with any, any automation thing. The difference is, forget MCP for a second, agent to agent, which is kind of supersedes MCP, is they've given the whole blueprint of the applications. Think Adobe. Adobe was the first one they got, right? You say to it, look, take this video, which we've just done. I want you to edit it. I want you to transcribe it. I want you to do the, the, the AI noise removal. I also want you to look at what we, they've been talking about in the transcript and look at what the key words that are trending at the moment on the social media. And then I want you to create a 60 second snippet, perfect for shorts, optimized, ready to go to SEO. And I want to A, B, a few of those, some with paid advertising, some without, and I want to post it to all of my channels and I want you to manage it. That will be hundreds of sub subtasks. Now, what they want you to do is not everyone's got an Adobe student, you know, subscription. They will say, okay, well, you don't have that. Let's pull Camtasia if you're on a Mac. Let's do Final Cut. You know, they'll pick whatever application that has an equivalent capability 
pull that down, maybe even start you on a 30-day trial just so it can get going and then destroy it all afterwards, right? And so the way I explain it the best is it's like worker bees, you know, they're off going on doing all the getting the honey, but actually the hive, fully functioning hive, is an agentic capability. The bees go off, don't find pollen. They don't send another set of bees. They communicate with each other. They learn from what they're doing. They know when there's a good yield, right? They know danger mm. and but they communicate with them each other but the goal is the honey and the honey is the end product right they have the output of it is we're successful or we're not successful together we live and we work together and i think this is where the coordination capability of agentic is choosing whether or not to execute in camtasia or in execute in uh, final cut it makes those decisions. It learns. It learns the tips and tricks. It goes off and reads the documentation to understand how to navigate through the application. It, it's exposed all the components that it knows it needs to run. It starts using the GPU because it wants to do it faster. It's optimizing the output for what it should look like on social media and what are those keywords that people want to hear and they're three and a half seconds before they drop off, how to keep them in there with not just, hey, it's Jonathan, you know, it's Today, you're going to learn this, and I'm going to then demonstrate it. They know the recipe of how to get that right. successful content. And the Gentech will be very useful at helping provide a whole toolkit that will support you. Now, in the real world, right, you still need social media experts who, sure. who will be involved in that process. They will be called upon by the worker bees to say, look at this. I think it's a brand violation. You know, we need to remove, should we remove this? They, there's been a bit of profanity. There was maybe some miscommunication. You know, is this approved? It's not. It's going to be touch points, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there is augmentation of with with Agentic, which will have real productivity stuff. But it's cross for us. I think we're so SDLC focused that we we think about SDLC. And yes, these will talk across this. They'll pass it zap tests to the security guys. Then look at the OWASP vulnerabilities. It'll then speak to people who are raising tickets and in their incident management systems in production and IT operations, all the other teams that are not just in the C, you know, the CICD kind of SDLC, but actually to the business, right? Agentic will open that door. Is it here today? It's starting to give, you know, give birth, right? You know, the the large action models, the text to in essence action, are supported by large vision models. However, vision can only take you so far. And what large vision models have done, like Omniparser from Microsoft, is they've understood what's in there. It knows where it's going. So it's, it's kind of already to, got the map. It started mapping out the application by learning it. It's not just looking at a screen and going, I see a cat, I see a dog. It's going, I know how I can interact with this, right? right. And that's where Agentic suddenly becomes meaningful compared to a large language model that generates text. We're all going to be laughing at each other in like, you know, three or four years. And that's my worry about, you know, Hollywoodizing ChatGPT. And then once it does that, it takes over the world and it destroys every human being. We've seen this movie. Thank you so much. You have had a great lesson in AI today, folks. Thank you, Jonathan, for being on the show. Thank you very much, Scott.